Hey there. This year I've been giving this talk on automation at a number of different Android conferences around the world. And I wanted to just take a chance to record that for the YouTube channel and share that with anybody that maybe isn't getting a chance to see that talk at the conferences and hopefully just uh, spark some ideas that you can maybe take back into your own teams and your own projects for how to maybe more effectively automate different parts of your development workflows. So you can find the uh, repository for this project uh, at this link here. It's on my GitHub uh, called Animation Sandbox. Uh, I will also include a link to that in the description down below. Uh, these slides are also available on Speaker Deck, which will also be linked to down below. And to just kind of give a larger outline here, uh, we're gonna be talking about kind of what things you might wanna automate uh, why you might want to automate in the first place. And then we're going to look at a few key areas of the development workflow, including automating your build, validating code quality, reviewing code, and deploying your app. And kind of within all those sections, there are going to be uh, a few key themes pop up. We're going to look at a number of different ways that you can add automated PR messages using danger. We're going to look at how you can automate KT lint tasks as an example of just automating code quality checks in general. We're going to look at some tricks within GitHub, including GitHub pull requests, uh, GitHub pull request templates and issue templates, and also how you can automate uh, releases with things like beta by Crashlytics or the Gradle, Gradle Play Publisher plugin. And uh, there'll be a few more things mixed in along the way as well. So with that, we want to start with this question of why automate in the first place? Why go through the trouble of automating things? And in a lot of ways, the answer is because we can. Uh, there are so many ways that we can improve our workflows by delegating tasks that we might have to do ourselves and take up time, energy, and resources that we could instead let the computer do or some kind of regulated job do. And kind of the, the overarching theme to all of this is we want to be able to consistently build the right thing at the right time. We want to always know that when we submit some code, that our project is in a buildable state for everybody working on the project. We don't want to get into this situation where it builds successfully on your machine, but not anybody else's on the team because that's how errors can arise and you want to avoid wasting that kind of time and you want to have consistency and confidence in what you are generating and releasing to your users. The next thing is we want to be able to save time and energy for the real challenges. It can be very frustrating and demoralizing if we have to spend all of our time fixing build issues or if we're spending all of our time kind of debating over code syntax or the semantics of naming. If we can put some rules in place and then have the kind of build machine check those automatically for us, then we can save more energy for the things that really matter, like talking about architecture or project strategy. And the last thing that I think is, is relevant here is that we can make projects more approachable by automating some of these things. If we're automating code quality checks, then new uh, contributors to our project automatically have some guardrails there to help them understand what the code uh, expectations are. If we are adding uh, PR comments to the pull request, again, they're going to be able to kind of onboard themselves in a sense through these comments. They're gonna know what types of things are expected, what the team is looking for. Um, and additionally, if things like releasing are really easy to do or running code quality checks locally are really easy to do, that just makes them that much easier to do from day one, which makes a new developer on your team feel much more home at the team and usually helps them feel happier in the long run. So now we've talked a bit about why to automate. Uh, let's think about what types of things that we can automate. And this is the easy answer here. Uh, all the things, like you mentioned before, um, you can think about really any part of your development workflow that's causing you a little bit of friction. You might be able to consider improving that through automation. 
And so we're going to look at these kind of four different parts of the development workflow. We're going to look at the build process, actually getting your project in a buildable state through some type of continue, continuous integration setup. We're going to look at checking code quality to make sure that the code that we are checking in is uh, following the standards that we want to make it easier to work with. We're going to look at some ways to improve the code review process to make sure that we are kind of adhering to those standards, that we are building the right thing, that everything is looking okay before it gets merged in. And finally, we'll look at the app deployment process and what we can do there to simplify things. And through all of these, I don't want this to be really a prescriptive idea, like you need to start doing this in your project, but more I want to just spark ideas. And so I want to have you think about this question. Where are you losing time, energy, or joy when you're building a project? Whether that is on a large team, a small team, or maybe even just as a solo developer, what types of things cause you to get frustrated or to lose a lot of time? And maybe think about whether or not you could improve that through some type of automation. So to start off, we're going to look at automating your build. And the reason we kind of start here is because the build is kind of at the center of all of this stuff. You know, as we can see here, the build really can do a lot of things for us. It can assemble our project, you know, check for quality, run tests, uh, deploy our app for us, help educate developers on our team. It can do a lot. But before we can do a lot of those, we really need to have that build set up. And really a build is nothing that special. It's really just kind of a server somewhere on the interwebs that has a configuration that tells it what tasks to run to basically uh, generate your build or automate quality checks, etc. And so those tasks might look something like this. It could be an assemble task, a test task, a deploy task. And if you're familiar with building for Android, you might be familiar with these tasks already. These are going to be the same types of tasks that you're running from the command line uh, with uh, for, for Gradle. So for example, if you're running, you know, something like dot slash uh, Gradle W assemble from the command line, that would be this assemble task within your build configuration. And thankfully these days, there's a lot of providers out there that can run a build for us and they're all quite easy to set up. A few examples would be Circle CI, Bitrise, Google Cloud Build, Code Magic, uh, GitHub's even getting into this space now. And so it's, it's pretty straightforward to get this going. And you can actually do this right from within GitHub or I think even GitLab as well if you're using that. So they really streamlined the process, making it easier for us to get this set up. And so in this talk, we'll be focusing all of our examples on a build using Circle CI, uh, which is just a platform that I have used now on a number of projects and I'm pretty familiar with. And so to build with Circle CI, there are a few things that you're going to have to do. And these are going to be very similar to regardless of what platform you choose. You're going to want to set up an account. You're going to need to add your project. So in this case, we'll be adding our GitHub project to our Circle CI dashboard. Then we're going to add a configuration file. And in that file, we'll add our build tasks. Then you're going to push that file to master, merge it in. And once that's done, you'll be able to start building your project anytime new commits or PRs are created in that repo. So this is a sample circle CI config file. And so this project, or excuse me, this file will live within your project directory under the directory dot circle CI slash config dot YML. Within this file, we're using a uh, YAML syntax here, and this is a, a kind of a pared down version of it, but ultimately, after defining kind of the build environment at the top of this file, we're going to come down and define the steps of this build process. So the first step is going to be to check out the code. We're then going to uh, define a run task here called download dependencies. That's just going to check for all of the, the Android dependencies that are needed for this project. We're then going to run our tests. And then finally, we're going to assemble our code. And once we've done all of that, within the CircleCI dashboard, we'll see some output kind of like this. So you see for each of these build steps, we're going to get some logged output and we're going to get a total time that it takes to run that task. 
And in a perfect world, when everything is building successfully, it'll look like this, where all of these things are highlighted with a little green color over there on the left, indicating they were successful. And when everything is successful, then in your GitHub PRs, you'll see something like this saying all checks have passed, there are no conflicts, and you can merge confidently here. However, in cases where something doesn't build successfully, we're going to see something like this. So in this case, our tests are not passing. That could be because of a, a compilation error, or it could be because the logic in the tests is no longer validated. And when we have that come up, we can update our pull request to look something like this. So in this case, the pull request is notifying us that the CircleCI checks have failed, and it's giving us this big red warning saying your tests have failed on CircleCI. Um, and so this gives us an indicator that, hey, maybe we don't want to merge this code in right now. There could be issues. And something to note here is that in this case, uh, the merge pull request button is still active, meaning that you could actually still merge this code even if the status checks are not passing. However, this is probably not what you want to do because it kind of defeats the purpose. If we're just going to merge in broken code, then why check it at all? So one thing that's really useful to do when setting up an automated build for your project is to go into GitHub and go into your settings and go to the branches section click add rule and then check this box here that says require status checks to pass before merging. So what this will do is it will basically disable the merge button until all of your status checks are successful. So in our last case, we would no longer be able to see that merge button until everything was passing correctly. And so that's what we see right here. Now the merge pull request button is disabled. And once we go back and fix those tests, we'd be able to merge this code successfully. So that's kind of a quick high level walkthrough of setting up an automated build with CircleCI. And like I said, that process is going to be very similar on other platforms as well. But kind of the key point here is that we now have an automated build process. We now know that when we are merging code in, that it is in a compiling state, that our tests are passing, and that we can have some level of confidence that it's gonna work consistently for everybody. And so now we can start to build on top of this and do more interesting things, which we'll start to talk about in the next section here. So now let's talk about how we can validate code quality to improve the development process. So when we talk about validating code quality, there's a number of things that we could need here. This could be things like checking the code formatting. This could be running our tests. This could be running uh, the Android linter. Could be uh, checking for code smells using a tool like Detect if you're writing your code in Kotlin. There's a lot of different tools here, but they all fall under kind of a similar pattern. They're all trying to make sure that our code is consistent and isn't doing anything that it shouldn't be. So we can really uh, automate these checks by integrating them into our automated build process. And for the kind of the general outline for all of these, you're going to want to kind of add the tool to your project and configure it in whatever mechanism it requires. And then you're going to integrate it with the build script. And so we're going to look at an example of uh, integrating the KT Lint tool with our automated build. Now, KTLint, if you don't know, is just a linter for Kotlin code, and you can integrate it in a number of ways, whether it's using a Gradle plugin or just custom Gradle tasks, but ultimately it, it outputs a KTLint check command for you. And so if you run that locally, it'll check the formatting of your code. Now to integrate it with our build, all we need to do is go back into our uh, CircleCI config file, we're going to add a new task. In this case, we're going to call it check code formatting. And then we're going to run the Gradle task using dot slash Gradle W ktlint check dash dash continue. Uh, the dash dash continue in this case will ensure that we get all of the output and that it doesn't just stop on the first failure. Once we've done that, we'll now see another task here within our CircleCI output. And if the formatting doesn't match the rules we've specified, then we'll get an error. 
So this is useful because now we can kind of ensure this formatting for everybody on our team. But there's still kind of a problem here, and it's kind of subtle. If we fail the build, that often then requires a lot of context switching for us. We might push up our pull request, you know, go away, get a cup of coffee or something, expecting to come back and merge it. And then we say, oh, shoot, my build is broken. Now I need to figure out what's wrong with it, fix that code, push it back up, and it starts to lose a lot of time. Especially if your build takes a lot of time, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. That's a lot of hours in your day that can be lost if you're pushing code that fails the build. So what we would like to be able to do is avoid failing our build if these code quality checks are not successful, especially because we can uh, validate those locally. And so we're going to look now at a couple ways to validate code quality checks on our local machine before pushing them up to the remote repository and failing the build. So with our example of, you know, KT Lint or Android Lint, you know, a lot of those we can reformat or run the Lint tool using the IDE itself. Um, again, all these different types of checks we can generally run from the command line as well. But for all of them, we basically want to be able to validate them before pushing code up to GitHub. So if we wanted to validate our code formatting using our IDE, there are a few things we could do to improve this. We could set our project code style from the predefined code style in our project. You could then customize that code style as desired, and you could update your git ignore file so that you can check that code style file into your repository so that anybody that's using you know, IntelliJ or Android Studio can be using that same code style file and be able to format the code correctly in the same way as everyone else. You can also set it up to optimize your imports on the fly. So like I've mentioned, you set up your code style file and then update your git ignore to look something like this. This starts off by basically saying to ignore everything within the .idea directory, which Android Studio or IntelliJ creates. But then below that, it adds some specific exceptions so that you can track things that you do want to store in the project. Examples include code styles, file templates, inspection profiles, scopes, copyright information. All of these are things that you do actually uh, want to share a lot of the time. And so by kind of adding them to this exceptions list, it allows you to check them in to your repo. Customizing your code style file might look something like this, where you'll basically have the name of the rule and then the value that the editor can pick up for us. And then finally, you want to check that optimize imports on the fly button. Now, if you have a computer that doesn't have a lot of memory or is maybe a little bit slower, you might not want to check this on just because it does kind of do some work in the background for you. But if you have a newer machine, checking this on can really help you make sure that your imports are always optimized and you don't have to worry as much about uh, running that optimization task before you push any code. Now, that's kind of how we can do it from the IDE. You can also run these checks from the uh, command line. And that's all well and good, but you have to remember to run those checks from the command line. If you don't remember it, uh, then you might fail your build. So there's something we can do with this, and that is to use Git hooks to run these checks for us automatically before we push code. And we're going to get into that in a second, but I do have other videos on my YouTube channel explaining exactly how to do this. You can look for the videos called, uh, you know, KT Lint Git Hooks, and uh, it'll walk through this process in more detail. But if you're not familiar, Git Hooks are basically shell scripts that Git can run uh, before or after events such as commit, push, and receive. A couple examples of this could be uh, right before you are doing a commit you could run some code. Or in a more specific case, let's say before we are going to push our code to our, our remote repository, we could check the formatting. And that's what we're going to walk through here. What we want to do is basically have a pre-push git hook that will run ktlint check for us and prevent us from pushing code if ktlint check doesn't succeed. And this script right here is all that is needed to do that. And it was adapted from a blog post out there that goes into more detail about how they came up with this. But basically, it just prints some output to the console for us. It runs the uh, check 
and then it reports back on the status and either allows us to push or prevents us from pushing. And this script basically lives within the dot git slash hooks directory within our project and has to be named pre dash push. But once you've added that directory to that, or excuse me, once you've added that file to that directory, this will work automatically anytime you're trying to push code. Now that still kind of requires you to manually go in and add that um, to, to your project so that you can have that Git hook set up. And you can automatically install that hook using uh, KT Lint a command line interface if you've installed it from your command line in that way. But again, that's a manual step and new developers on your team probably aren't going to know to do that. So let's walk through an example of how we could actually automate the installation of the script. So we're going to take that same script, but we're going to change its location now. So now it's going to live within our root directory within a directory called scripts slash git hooks. And then we're going to name the file pre dash push dot sh. And now we can go in and create some custom Gradle tasks that will essentially copy that shell script into the proper dot git slash hooks directory and update the file permissions for us so that as soon as we run a clean within our project, it's going to install that hook for us. And so these tasks live within this git dash hooks dot Gradle file, and we can simply apply that Gradle file from within any of our other build.gradle files. And now we've automated this process of installing that Git hook, which is really helpful. You can find this specific code in that repository again, like I mentioned, and you could copy it directly over to your project and see exactly how it works. But so with that, we now have a way to prevent pushes of our code that will fail the build. And we can share that with the team so that anybody can basically have these uh, hooks or these code styles installed and we can validate in the same way. And this was with KT Lint specifically, but it would work with things like Android Lint as well. Okay, so now we're into my favorite part of this whole talk. And one of the areas where I think automation is maybe undervalued, but also really potentially powerful to, you know, saving time and energy and also just developing a really effective team culture around code review. So what do we want to do when we think of reviewing code? Well, we want to validate the changes. We might want to discuss approaches. We definitely want to learn. We want to be learning both ways, both from more senior developers on the team or junior developers. Everybody is hopefully getting a chance to share and learn from one another. And one way in which I think that we can do this is through the use of PR templates. Now, what is a PR template? Well, it's a way of helping us avoid a situation like this one right here. So if I see this pull request come through, that just says something like update the brushes and doesn't say what brushes doesn't say how they were updated doesn't give additional context really doesn't give anything that useful this is not setting uh, myself or whoever uh, is kind of creating the code it's not setting us up to have an effective code review uh, process basically we want to avoid this type of lack of detail what we would like to do is favor and encourage something more like this this example of a pull request has a lot more information. It's prompting us to link any related to do's here. It's giving us a list of high level changes. It's giving us a place to add any additional information or context. And then it's even giving us a little interactive checklist for us to mark off things that have been added like tests or translations. This right here is the type of thing that we can help nudge developers to with pull request templates. A pull request template is really just a, uh, a markdown file that lives within the dot GitHub directory of your project. So if you're not using GitHub, this doesn't apply to you specifically. And I keep meaning to check if GitLab has something similar, but I haven't. Uh, I apologize for that. However, if you are using GitHub, you can create a markdown file called pull underscore request underscore template dot MD, put that in the dot GitHub directory. And then any markdown you place in that file will be used to pre-populate the description of your pull request. So you see here, this markdown is basically what was used to generate this 
uh, description template from the previous slide. And so once we have added that file to our project repository, when we create a new pull request, it'll automatically be pre-populated with this example right here. So this is what was generated from the previous markdown. So you see we have the to-do section, proposed changes, you know, info, the, the checklist, which we can, act, can actually interact with and toggle those check boxes on or off. And then we also have a screenshot section down at the bottom to give an example of, you know, here's what this screen looked like before, here's what it looks like now. Uh, and that small thing right there actually has saved us a lot of time on our team. And I actually think can be really valuable because it goes a long ways towards helping the reviewer understand what they're looking for. And, and really just this thing right here, it, it encourages contributors to provide enough detail. You know, it's not forcing them to, they can still ignore this, but if you open up a pull request and all you have to do is kind of fill in the information, it doesn't take as much mental effort as it would if you had to remember all of this stuff from scratch and then go in and add it. So it's a slight nudge, but I think it overall leads to higher quality pull requests and review. And so that was pull request templates, but we can do something similar with issue templates. Issue templates work very much the same way. Uh, we can again create a markdown file in the .github slash issue underscore template directory. In this case, we've created a issue template called bug report. Um, and at the top of the markdown file, there's a little bit of metadata. So in this case, we've named this template bug report and we've given it a description, which is to create a report to help us improve. You can also then add labels. So in this case, we've added a bug label and you can automatically add assignees if you want. And then below that, it works just the same way as the pull request template. So it's just regular GitHub Markdown. And here's another example. This is a feature request template. And so in this case, it's called feature underscore request dot MD. We've updated the title and then the description and all the information are once again different to be more specific to a feature request. And so once these are in place within that repository, if you go to create a new issue, you'll be presented with this little dialog that'll let you create a bug report template or a feature request template. Or if you want just a regular non-templated issue, you can still do that. But this gives uh, contributors a starting point. This can help guide them again towards giving you the proper amount of information to be helpful for your team. And once again, once you've created that template, it's going to pre-populate that description field, just like with the pull request template. So this right here could be a good way of helping people make sure they give you reproduction steps or operating system info, things that you'll need to fix that issue or understand the feature request. And then one last little tip here, um, not super related to all this, but I think it's super useful. If you're using pull rec or if you're using excuse me GitHub issues, you can automatically close issues by referencing them from a commit or from a pull request using special keywords. So in this example right here, under the to-do section, I've typed fixes number 10. When this pull request is then closed, issue number 10 will automatically be closed. And this kind of syntax works with other keywords as well. You could say closes, fixes, resolves, and there's a number of other ones in there too. But this can just be a nice way to kind of simplify the management of your issues when you're working with your pull requests. And now this is maybe the, the most interesting part of this, this whole talk. And this is the idea of supercharging your pull requests with danger. Now, what is danger? And I mean this in a software sense, not in a life sense. Hopefully you understand danger in life. Uh, but basically danger is a tool that can run during your CI process. And it basically gives you a chance to automate certain tasks or perform analysis about uh, code review uh, chores or uh, different just aspects of your process. Basically, it gives you hooks with which to uh, run some code and report back on what it finds. So we can do a number of things with danger as well. We can do things like add informational messages to a pull request. We could add inline linting comments when we have errors. We could check our APK size. We could check for dependency updates and honestly, so much more. This is an example of what that could look like. In this case, I have a bot set up called Goobar bot. 
And that bot will run these uh, danger checks, and then when it reports back, it'll add a comment to my pull request for me automatically. So in this case, it's indicating that there are 11 dependencies with new versions out there. It's giving a nice little helpful thank you message just to show some appreciation for the work done. This is a, a nice touch in my opinion because it promotes you know, a positive code review experience. And then it also reports back on the APK size. Um, and so we're gonna look at these, uh, these specific examples and then also some additional examples in the following slides. So first off, to set up Danger, there are a couple different ways to go about it. Um, the easiest one that I've uh, seen so far is to uh, use kind of the Ruby install version. And so basically what this, in, in, ugh, what this involves is uh, adding a gem file to your project or updating it if you don't already have one. Uh, then run bundle install from the command line. Then run bundle exec Danger init and then follow the CLI setup process. And so the gem file that needs to be updated simply needs to have gem and danger added to it. And then as you run through the rest of that, it will set that uh, danger installation up for your project. To add danger to your build, we're gonna need to add a couple of tasks in our case. We're gonna run one task to do the uh, bundle install command and then another task to do the bundle exec danger command. And then we also need to make sure that we have Ruby installed on our machine as well, or excuse me, installed on our, our build machine as well to make sure that it can recognize these commands. And now to start adding these individual messages, we can update what is called the danger file. That danger file will just live in our root directory. So in this case, to add that simple thank you message, we can use the message command and then we can add a string. And then within that string, we actually can get access to some uh, metadata about the pull request. So in this case, I can get the author of the pull request and we can say thank you to that author. In this case, we could also do a message that includes a little bit of logic. So in this case, we can add a warning that basically says this is a work in progress pull request if the title of the PR includes the string, you know, open bracket, WIP, close bracket. So this is a way to basically warn a reviewer that, hey, this isn't quite ready to review. And you could do this with uh, any a number of different conventions you wanted for your team. You know, in our example before, we saw that we could report on the APK size. And this is actually quite simple. Uh, we can create basically a variable here called APK underscore size and then we can get access to the file on our local build machine uh, that was generated by our uh, build essentially. So in this case, we can get access to the APK, check on that APK size, and then report that size out again with the message command. Having this uh, APK message is actually really helpful because it makes the size of your APK visible all the time. Uh, and on our team, we found several cases where our APK size grew unexpectedly simply because we're seeing it so often in our pull request that we were able to recognize that when it happened. You know, another example here is, you know, again, encouraging people to provide enough information in the description. So we saw before with the pull request template, we could kind of nudge users in that direction. But in this case, we could also provide a warning as a message if the length of that description body is less than some character amount. So in this case, if the description is in at least 20 characters, we could have a warning saying, please provide a pull request description. Now, uh, checking dependency updates is something that we have used and can be kind of useful to keep your project up to date. To do that, we are using a Gradle plugin um, seen down below, uh, gitcom, github, ben-mains, versions. Basically, this will provide us a Gradle task called dependency updates that will just report back a list of all the project dependencies that have an update available, and it lists those out to an output file. Then we can process that output file from our danger file using something like this that basically just reads through that uh, output report and checks the number of lines of code. And then we're doing some logic on there that says if we have more than 10 libraries with updates, we don't want to report every single one because it'd be too messy. So we'll just report a single line that says there are X number of dependencies with new versions. If there are less than 10 updates, we'll go ahead and print all of those out. 
And so in the case where we have a lot of updates available, we might have this single line of warning right here, which is very clean. It's not intrusive, but it lets us know, hey, you have some updates that uh, could be applied. And in the other case, if you have a lot of updates, or if you don't have quite as many updates as available, it'll look something like this. Now, this is a lot of output to have in a PR message, which is why we only do this um, past some th certain threshold. Uh, but it can be useful to see exactly which updates uh, are available. And you might want to do something like this, maybe in a timed build. Maybe you have a build that goes out every night at midnight. You could run this in that build since people probably aren't seeing it as often. And then it would provide that full output for you. And then in your more regular builds throughout the day, you could hide this. And we'll look at some ways in which you might be able to think about customizing those builds later on. Uh, another really cool thing you can do with Danger is to provide inline comments anytime you have a lint issue. So to do that, we're going to add this additional uh, Ruby gem called danger textstyle underscore format. Basically, this knows how to take a check style format file and add inline comments for whatever the reported issues are. In our Danger file, we are then point that Ruby gem towards the uh, directory where the output will be. And then we can point it towards uh, the check style format file. And what that will do is anytime we have a KT lint issue in this case, it will actually report back using our bot account as a PR comment. So instead of having uh, the reviewer have to go through and kind of be nitpicky and add all these comments, which wastes a lot of time and energy and can sometimes lead to resentment, the bot just does this automatically. And it's hard to get angry at the bot because it's just a bot and it's just there always doing its thing consistently. And so this can be a really useful way of kind of uh, saving time and energy and avoiding some frustration in the process. Um, it also makes it easy to understand where these linting issues are. If you don't have something like this and your build fails because of a linting issue, you have to then go and dig through the logs to understand what's going on. This brings that information front and center and becomes very easy to fix. If you are doing inline linting comments, you probably want to add this line to your danger file as well. Basically, it says dismiss out of range messages. What this will do is it will ignore any linting issues that are outside the scope of your PR. So if you fix 10 files, but you have a 1000 files with linting errors, you don't want to be on the hook for all 1000 errors in your project. You only want to understand the errors relevant to the code that you touched. So adding this will do that for you and really clean up the, the message and increase the effectiveness of those checks. And that's kind of just a subset of what you can do with Danger and your PRs. There's a lot of other stuff you could do. You could run these with Android Lint. Uh, you could add test coverage checks. Uh, you could create a task to look for string translations, changes in APK size. There's a lot of potential here, and I really encourage you to think about you know, what types of checks or messages you might be able to add to your project to make them more effective. And finally, I want to look at this last section here, which is just deploying your application. You know, there's a lot of different ways we could think about deploying your app. You could have a daily build. You could have a scheduled build that maybe says Tuesdays and Fridays, we're going to release something. You could have a triggered build that maybe triggers based on a Slack command or maybe a Basecamp command, or maybe it simply runs every time you create a pull request and merge it in. You could also follow the YOLO method where you're just kind of generating builds whenever you want. Maybe that's locally, maybe you're triggering the machine somehow, but there's no real rhyme or reason to it. Um, there might be a time and place for all of these and kind of the mix of them is probably going to be dependent upon your team. But regardless of what you're doing, there's some interesting ways we can think about uh, automating these and customizing them. So one way in which I found really interesting and useful is kind of customizing our app deployment. And basically what I mean by that is by changing the deployment behavior based on where we're merging to. So in one case, we could say if we merge to develop, we're going to distribute a debuggable test build via one mechanism. And if we merge into master, we're going to upload a release build to Google Play. So in the case of merging to develop, we have something like this. Uh, this, this is not a sample from CircleCI. This is actually from a Google Cloud build. This is a part of our um, 
uh, basically configuration file for our build um, on our Android team at Pixite. My colleague Ryan Harder came up with this. And basically what this says is that anytime we merge into uh, develop, we're going to run this Crashlytics upload distribution debug command, which will distribute that to our uh, testers that are signed up with the uh, beta by Crashlytics app. So this makes it really easy to distribute testable builds by simply merging to develop. And we've taken this one step further and automated the release notes for this as well. So when we do run that Crashlytics command to distribute the test build, we also create release notes based on uh, the basically git log output between the current develop and master branch. We do a lot of squash and merge. So a lot of our feature uh, PRs basically boil down to a single uh, line of output or not in the Git history. So we can end up with these really clean release notes for our internal testers. And now similarly, we wanna to deploy to uh, the Play Store anytime that we merge into master. And to do that, we're using the Gradle Play Publisher uh, Gradle plugin. So once again, anytime we detect a merge into master, we're running a specific Gradle task, which in this case is publish release APK. Now publish release APK will basically take all of our application information as well as made metadata that lives within the project itself, such as the products, the listings, contact information, screenshots. It basically bundles all that stuff up and pushes it up to the Play Store for us anytime that we merge to master. So this makes it really easy to basically store the release info in the project, uh, track changes over time, and especially makes it easy for anyone on the team to basically release our app, uh, at least to internal testers. All we have to do is merge a pull request into master. And so this makes it really easy for a new person to the team to come in and start being productive and feel like they can release the product, which is really powerful when you're starting a new team. So that's kind of it for this iteration of this talk. Um, you know, we've looked at automating the small things, lots of little tasks throughout the development workflow that can add up to some big time savings, to some uh, friction being removed, and hopefully to us being happier, more efficient developers. You know, we looked at how to kind of set up our build. We looked at some patterns for validating code quality and how to automate that for everyone on our team. We looked at how we can make the code review process more efficient and more enjoyable. And finally, we saw a few examples of how to customize your app deployment based on things like which branch you set up or maybe time of day that you are merging in. So once again, I just wanna leave you with this question of, you know, is there places in your project where you are losing time, energy, or joy to some task? And if so, have you considered automating it for you and for everyone else on your team? So once again, uh, I have the, the repository here that has examples of pretty much everything that I went through in this slide deck. Um, again, that'll be linked in the description down below. There will also be links to a lot of these other uh, blog posts or documentation resources that can help you learn more about some of these techniques for automating parts of your development flow. And with that, uh, I will just say thank you. If you stay tuned and watch the whole thing, um, if you have questions, feel free to contact me on social media, leave a comment down below. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, pretty much all the places. And with that, I will see you next time, devs. Thanks for watching.